Let's try. <laughs> Take three. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, no, I was born in Tallahassee and went to school for the full 12 years there. And uh, my brother preceded me in the Air Force, flew over to Tallahassee, inverted um, when I was in grade 10. That's when I made up my mind that I'm going to fly that Sabre at that time. So I was very happy to have succeeded there. I knew I had to have pretty high marks in certain subjects like mathematics, physics, chemistry, trigonometry. And uh, so I really buckled down and graduated with those marks, pretty high marks. And uh, that gave me the credentials to get into the Air Force and Air Crew. And so I proceeded from there. Okay, and where did you go to uh, as far as your training went for... Uh, well, I, I, I was sent to London, Ontario, uh, where their officer school was. And, uh, and uh, following that I went to Centralia from my basic training. I was an experimental uh, student on chipmunk airplanes. A very light airplane, very simple to fly, and to separate the men from the boys. It was a cheap way to find out who was going to make it or not. And so I did, and then went to uh, Gimli from there, flew 233s, the first jet airplane I've ever been on. Well, actually, I went from Harvard's, then to the T-33s, and uh, that was quite interesting. Um, and then finally to Chatham, New Brunswick, and through the Sabre at their operational training unit. This prepared you for a, a career in Germany, where I was eventually sent to uh, as part of NATO and uh, proceeded from there. So where did you go in Germany? Was it Germany or France that you went to? No, I went to Germany. Okay. Which Zweibrücken. Zweibrücken uh, three wing for two years. I ended up at Zweibrücken again ten years later on the CF-104 and flew there for five years. So. What squadron were you with, uh, with the Sabres? 434. 434 squadron. And what position were you just, uh, were you a pilot the whole time that you were there for yeah. flying? And yeah, just an operational pilot. Okay. Yeah. And uh, from there, did you end up with the Golden Hawks uh, directly, or did you uh, go somewhere else before you ended up with the Hawks? No, I, uh, I went uh, back to Canada and was uh, sent to a training school uh, in Gimli where I instructed on T-33s and I was there for about a year and a half when they, the Golden Hawks contacted me and contacted my bosses and said uh, we want them down here on the Golden Hawks. Had you had previous uh, aerobatic experience? Oh, Is yeah. that why they got you in the Yeah, model? my, uh, my brother-in-law Jim McComb who was also a member and a future leader of the Golden Hawks, was uh, in Swyrokin at the time I was there. And every time we went up, we did a few loops and rolls. <laughs> Wasn't really on the schedule, but uh, he, uh, he liked to test me out. And I made it around a roll and I made it through a loop. And uh, so he knew that I had some potential as an aerobatic pilot, so he was uh, one of the first to be selected as a member of the Golden Hawks. And uh, when we lost a few people, or at least one, uh, and they needed a, another replacement, they, uh, they sent for me. And Jim McComb, where he said, See if we can get this guy transferred to Chatham, because I know his potential is reasonable. 
So what were the early days of the Golden Hawks like? When, uh, because you were an original member of the team, so you were there for their first year of training and getting things on the go. How, yeah. how was that? A lot of, lot of flying, a lot of uh, practice. Um, I practiced as a formation pilot uh, on Jim's wing, or on Fern Villeneuve's wing, actually. And uh, as a as a solo pilot as well, so I practiced low level aerobatics, and that's uh, down pretty close to the ground, 300 feet above the treetops, and uh, loops and rolls, that sort of stuff, and uh, we. Uh, we traveled a little bit. Uh, we did our first show in St. John's, Newfoundland, and the fog she sure was thick. <laughs> uh, we waited, I think, three days and finally it cleared enough so that we could do a show. And how was the show received, uh, being the first one that you were doing for, for a crowd? Oh, well, fairly good. Yeah, people were quite impressed. We were a little bit loose. Um, the first couple of months, until we we got more precise, we got the formation closer together, and uh, that was good. Before you went to uh, St. John's, you guys had to had to do a performance for the brass in Ottawa, isn't it? And, That's uh, right. How did they uh, How did they react to the, uh, to I, the demonstration? I, I'm I'm thinking that they they reacted pretty good. You know, they thought this was a good thing. It was going to be impressive to the young people, which was the main reason for the Golden Hawks in the first place, was to inspire young kids to go to the recruiting centers and join up as pilots. And it worked. There were a lot of uh, new recruits that um, were inspired by the Golden Hawks to join the Air Force and uh, take up pilot training. It was something that uh, The, uh, the brass thought it was a good thing, to the point where they actually used the recruiting money, the budget for recruiting, and turned it over to the Golden Hawks to keep them operational. So, that was good. Yeah. So what was it like, a, a typical day, uh, a training day versus an actual air show day? What, what was it like? as a pilot of the, one of the Golden Hawks? Well, uh, we had the um, schedule that we would fly at least three trips, three practice trips a day, five days a week. If we missed a, a day due to weather, we'd fly on Saturday. We made sure that we had the practice. That was the most important. <clears throat> and that worked out well. Um, very rare that we couldn't practice, so uh, using Saturday as an alternate day was, was a rare occasion. We didn't, we didn't mind at all, of course, because the more flying we could do, the more we liked it. Yeah. Yeah, it was just a very pleasant thing is to get up in the airplane and do your practice. Did you lose much time for aircraft uh, breakdowns or repairs or anything? No, the ground crew was just fantastic. They, they were just unbelievable. Uh, they were, I'm not sure if they were hand-picked or what, but uh, they really knew that aircraft inside and out. And it was very rare that an aircraft would be uh, unserviceable. Um, 
And if you stir it up and you had a snag, a problem with the aircraft, they would be all over that aircraft like ants. And uh, in sh very short order, that snag was rectified. It was fixed. It's amazing. They were wonderful technicians. Did you do all of the uh, training activities in Chatham, or w would you do the practices every place you went to with the uh, to do the shows? We do uh, practices uh, other places as well. Yeah. Now, as far as the air show day, it was just the, the one performance uh, per day? Yes. And how long did the performance normally last? About 40 minutes. And what was your role? I know it changed, I think, in the three years you were with the team, but uh, what was your role in the, uh, in the formation uh, for the flying? Okay, I started off as a, uh, as a spare commentator. We had commentators. And uh, then when we lost a few people, I ended up as a second solo. And that was uh, J.T. Price was the uh, first solo, and I, I ended up uh, flying with him after uh, our friend Jeff Kerr was killed in Calgary. Um, very unfortunate. But uh, I went from uh, second solo uh, to uh, the slot man. That's the guy who was in the box. Uh, the four planes is one here, one there, one here, and the, the guy in the middle. That's the slot man, or the box man. And I flew that for the second year behind uh, Fern Villeneuve. And uh, finally in the third year when Fern had to retire from the Hawks and Jeb, uh, Jim McComb took over as the lead, I ended up as uh, number one solo and led the two solo aircraft. And so what would that involve, being the solo? Well, um, it was to fill in that time when the uh, formation was either turning around and coming back for the next maneuver, like a loop or a roll or whatever. And so you wanted to fill that time with some activity. And so we would come around uh, our two uh, solar airplanes and do a a roll or a coordinated roll or a loop or, or a, a 360 around the airfield and uh, we filled in that time so there wasn't any blank spaces. Now the uh, Golden Hawk aircraft themselves, they started off as Sabre 5s and then they uh, returned it and you got Sabre 6s later on. How did they compare to each other? To uh, as far as flying them? Significantly. The uh, Sabre 6 was a, a much better airplane. It had a bigger engine. It had the Arenda 14 and it had a slotted wing, which means that it could turn much tighter before it would stall. And uh, the loops became lower, or the Cubanates or whatever would uh, be lower to the ground and uh, it was just a uh, significantly better aerobatic aircraft. What sort of uh, memories uh, do you have? Is there any memories that stick out from your days uh, from each of the years? Is there a certain air show or a certain thing that happened that uh, comes into play? Well, um, we did some shows down in the States where I can remember the FAA was more strict 
been uh, transferred to Canada with respect to uh, how far you're out from the crowd and all that. And they, uh, in Pensacola, they laid down the rule. This is what you are to do, and this is when you're going to do it, and that sort of stuff. And Jim McComb was uh, the leader at the time. And as soon as we got airborne, he said, okay, everybody, switch off your radios. <laughs> and I guess the FAA was screaming over the air, saying, uh, you're way too low, you're too close, and of course we just ignored them. We didn't really switch off our radios, we just decided not to respond. So that was kind of interesting. They had a, uh, um, that was at Las Vegas. No, I'm sorry, that was at uh, Pensacola, where the Blue Angels were. We also did a couple of shows at uh, Las Vegas, at Nellis Air Force Base, which was kind of cute. Um, they, uh, had a whole bunch of rules there as well. So the control tower had a trap door in it. We just had a whole bunch of people stand on the trap door and the FAA couldn't get up to tell us this was not right. You shouldn't be doing this. And, uh, you know, we did it and talked later. Um, you mentioned the Blue Angels. Uh, did you guys perform with the Blue Angels or the Thunderbirds, the U.S. Thunderbirds? Uh, yes, we have. We have shows? actually flown with them, but not during the show. The Blue Angels were outstanding. They were very, very close to each other. They lose a few people, but uh, their performance is uh, outstanding. And they were good. Thunderbirds were good as well. Mm -hmm. But I think as far as close formation was concerned, the Blue Angels just went step ahead. Was there any other memories that you had from uh, air shows? Anybody that you met uh, along the way uh, that's, that, that were impressed with what you guys were doing? You know, if you know a person by the name of... Uh, Scholes. He was, uh, he flew a, uh, a super chipmunk. And uh, the guy was, he'd try anything. He came across the airfield one time, he was standing on the wing <coughs> with one hand down on the stick and, and came across the airfield like that. Um, he was uh, well known. Um, as being a, well, he, he won the uh, world championship uh, a number of times, apparently. And he came down and said to me personally, I like what you do, not with the Sabre, with the 104 at the time, CF-104. That was quite a compliment from, coming from him. Um, so the uh, air show season basically ran from, let's say, from May to October? Something like that, yeah. So what would you do after the season ended? We would instruct. Uh, we'd be, if we were in Shadow, we were instructing on, sa on Sabres, um, taking new students through the Sabre course. and. Uh, So we spend our time instructing uh, when we're not flying with the Hawks. How, and uh, so you left, it was uh, 1961, was when you finished with the, with the yeah, Hawks? Yes. And where did you go after that? Well, uh, Iron Bill McBride 
who was the air officer commanding of uh, training, he decided that we had too much fun and sent us all recruiting. So I went to Halifax here and recruited for three and a half years. My comrade and colleague, Ed Rose Deba, went to Toronto and so forth. So we, we had to sit behind a desk for three and a half years. Did you see a lot of people come in that wanted to be pilots like you guys? Oh, yes. Yeah. And once your tour in recruiting was over, where did you go? Uh, I went back uh, to Chatham. Uh, on the, the CF, uh, the Sabre, it was called the Sabre Transition Unit, and it um, even though I had flown the Sabre before, this was low level flying, right in the treetops, 60 feet over top of the treetops, and um, it was to prepare us for the 104 course, which was a, a nuclear course. We were flying, we we're going to fly CF-104s with a 70 kiloton nuclear weapon underneath. Not really, but a simulated one. But we we're supposed to be pre prepared to fly the 104 with that weapon under underneath us. And uh, so the Sabre course at Chatham was in preparation for going to Coal Lake where the nuclear course was being conducted, the CF-104 course, which is an outstanding aircraft. Was it a lot faster than the Sabre? Oh, very much so. Mach 2. 1,400 miles an hour. It was, uh, it was just a rocket with a pilot in it. So they said. And after the Sabre transition unit, you went back to Germany? Um, yes. Went to Cool Lake, took the course there. And then went back to Germany to Swybrücken to 434 Squadron, the same squadron I was on, on Sabres. And uh, flew there for three years until it closed down and then went to Baden, Salingen. Also in Germany, and uh, flew there for another four, uh, uh, two years. And then came home. Did you get out then, or did, were you still in? Oh, no, no, I was still in. I, I came back to Cool Lake and instructed them on CF-104, which gave me nine years on that airplane. And uh, and then, of course, it was time for another ground tour. So I ended up as a commanding officer of a recruiting center in Edmonton. And I then went from there to Summerside and got into an aircraft with a co-pilot, a navigator, a flight engineer, and two pair of rescue guys in the back, which is the first time that I've ever had anything like that. Usually it was me and the airplane, and that was it. And that's where I got out of the Air Force. So is there anything that sticks out from your time with the Golden Hawks that was uh, your, your most favorite memory? Um, well, there was so many incidents where uh, um, when we landed, we'd get out of our airplanes and go over to the fence that cordoned the citizens off from the aircraft. So many kids asking for autographs. That was quite gratifying. It was quite nice. They really uh, genuinely uh, 
admired what we did. And that was good. All right, well, um, I think that, uh, that covers that part, but uh, with regards to the upcoming air show and uh, getting together, and it's been 50 years since the Hawks have, uh, have, have been finished, they're, they're finally here performing, is there anything you'd like to uh, say to your uh, comrades that are going to be there, your old, uh, uh, your old Golden Hawk mates that, uh, that, that are going to be able to come out to the show and stuff like that, or uh, yeah. any of the people that are there? Yeah, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm not going to be able to make that uh, day, but uh, illness prevents me from uh, moving around too much these days, but I I know they're, they're going to enjoy the show because it's something that's pretty spectacular to see the uh, Hawk One there once again. It's always nice to see that aircraft fly by, and uh, I hope to maybe watch it on TV or something like that. Okay. Anything else? No, I think that's it. Uh,